They went after um, unfair taxes, uh, especially ones that, that tax things like dogs and horses that, that Kanaka Maoli actually depended on uh, for subsistence or for livelihoods. Um, they went after, they, they were trying to build a new kind of health care system into, um, into the territory, and they were looking for new ways uh, to help educate Hawaiians and to give them advantages. All of these kinds of measures the governor over, uh, overturned, he vetoed, and they were not able to overturn those vetoes. When, in 1902, when um, sort of the, this is after the two-year period, they, they, they had a, you know, they were elected in 1900, the Home Rule Party was I effectively in control of uh, the legislature for those two years. In 1902, they were going in to be re-elected. Re There's a new election cycle. There was a huge co uh, convention of all the home rulers. And in something that just seems so unfortunate, and yet when we think about Hawaiian people, seems so much like us. There were disagreements in the convention over who got to participate. Prince Jonah Kuhio, who had been abroad, and had been living away for the, la for, the, for the previous four years, was anxious to be incorporated into the party and to become a party leader. Perhaps he was given promises. No one really knows for sure. But when he was not allowed to become a leader in the party, he walked out and he took with them practically half the Home Rule delegation because he was a chief. I think about this because it, in many ways Hawaiians have always been really independent politically as individuals. Um, and, and thinking of my father and my grandfathers, um, thinking about the way they, they, they dealt with politics, you could never really pin them down. Sometimes they were conservative, sometimes they were very liberal or almost radical, but they always thought for themselves. And I think that those home rulers who walked out of that convention were thinking for themselves. They were thinking, you know, our chief, Kuhio, was um, he, he, he was stabbed in the back, and we are not going to support a party or any kind of organization that does that to another Hawaiian. So they walked out. And what we know happened with many of those Hawaiians, led by Kuhio, is that they joined the Republican Party in 1902. And the Republicans took control of that legislature, and they didn't let go of control. They didn't lose control of that legislature until 1954. For 50 years, the Republicans held sway here, and what they needed, the Republicans were mostly, you know, it was, it was big money, it was the big five, it was plantation interests, it was money interests on, 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 uh, on, on Merchant Street, it was money, and it was white people. And they got a lot of Hawaiian votes, basically by encouraging Hawaiians to believe that their biggest threat to them was not haoles, was not that money, it was Japanese labor. It was Chinese laborers. Japanese and Chinese who were not made citizens in 1900, but whose children born after 1900 would all be citizens. And all of those boys would be able to vote by 1921. At some point, they told Hawaiians, and they said it over and over and over again, you guys are going to lose to the Asians. You're going to lose to the Japanese. They're going to take all of this away from you. They're going to take your place here in the islands, just like the Hawaiians hadn't taken our place. And you need to be afraid of them. You need to be afraid of them, and you need to bind together with us. Sad to say, but understandably, many Hawaiians chose that route. And if you look at the territorial period, you'll see that many Hawaiians were appointed into judgeships. They were police officers. Um, they were politicians, mayors, um, delegates to, 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 the, to, the, um, to, to, to Washington, including Kuhio, Jarrett, Houston. Those are all Hawaiians, all Hawaiians. Um, appointments to, you know, all kinds of county and, and, and territorial jobs went first to Hawaiians uh, than to anyone else. And it's this kind of cooperation. In this period, and this is what I really want to talk about, our, our Hawaiian leaders, social and political leaders, were encouraging Hawaiians to compete. 
They were encouraging Hawaiians to give up the language, to learn English, uh, to find education, to make sure that they were in the vanguard of people that were being advanced in society, to, to go for those good jobs, yeah? uh, to get themselves politically well placed. And part of the fear was if they didn't do this, that those places would be taken by Asians. It may be a sad thing to hear, but that was the story of my parents' generation. Competition, stay ahead of the game. And it's not, you know, and, and, and not all Hawaiians responded to that call. Many, many Kanaka Maoli, as uh, Deviana McGregor points out, basically turned their backs on the whole system and said, I don't want to participate. I want to fish, I want to grow taro, I want to live on the homesteads. I don't want to have anything to do with that, that BS. Some Hawaiians participated, many turned their backs on it. And meanwhile, while all of this was going on, you know, the Asians, through, the, through, through, through labor and through the Democratic Party, did begin to build themselves a very strong, powerful base. And in 1954, they took the legislature. In 1962, they took the governor's office. And it's been that way ever since. I do not think, I do not think that Hawaiians did bad things in the territory. I think that we, we behaved according to what we believed was the proper way to strengthen the nation. I think of my father, who was a politician in the 1950s and 1960s, a Republican politician. His feeling was always that, you know, the only way you beat the Hullies is you have to beat them here in politics. You have to get involved. You have to be there. But I also know that many people on my mother's side of the family had nothing to do with Hawaii society. They thought it was heva. They thought it was unfair. They thought there were things about it. They, they weren't willing to make those kinds of moral and ethical compromises to participate and to compete on that level. And I tend to think that it was my mother's side that, that, that really tended to affect the movement as it exists since then, since the 1950s and 1960s a movement of people that are really devoted to Hawaiian values and ethics. Um, a movement of people, as I'm, I'm running out of time, yeah? A movement of people that are devoted to, um, no longer to competition, no longer to, 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 to competing within this Hawaii way, but really getting back to our own set of values and our own way of doing things and our own nation. I think that that's what our generation has done. And I think to a certain extent our generation and the one right after us. I do wonder about our younger children and whether they are following in our footsteps. With all that, I think I've come to an end. Um, there is one last thing I wanted to say. I hear there's a lot of discussion and argument about uh, occupation versus colonialism. Make no mistake, legally, it's occupation. The United States invaded a nation state, took our land, took our government, and they are still here. It's an occupation. Socially, <laughs> economically, it's colonialism. These guys have established themselves as, the, for many people, the baseline of how we operate. We continue to try to, you know, the extent to which that government is in place here and we're still cooperating with it, that's colony. All I got to say. <laughs>